I'm going to start that now. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Jeff Ward. I've known I've known Jeff for oh a very long time, going back to the early 1980s when Jeff was a PhD student at Purdue in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and I was an undergraduate there, and I was his field grunt for a couple of summers and a couple of winters. And uh, I've known Jeff since, and. Uh, Jeff and I reconnected a couple of years ago when we found we were both doing work with flame weeding and I saw what a good, good presenter Jeff was and I um, asked if he would like to join on a couple of webinars and he was eager and he suggested crop tree management for the December webinar and Jeff's going to be joining us back again in March for a webinar on controlling buckthorn. Jeff's been doing a great deal of research on that as well and as the I think that probably the national leader in, in managing buckthorn. But with that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to turn the the floor over to Jeff, if you will. I'm going to turn off my microphone and hover here in the background and and let uh, let Jeff talk with us about his his research and other research dealing with uh, crop tree management to improve the growth and survival of hardwoods. Jeff, thank you. Thank you, Pete. Um, this is going to be a new experience for me, so hopefully everybody will bear with me too as I go through this technology. Uh, I want to thank you all, and I'm going to be talking about crop tree uh, management today, as you might know. It's interesting, if you look at the picture on the slide right now, we're actually going to see that tree later uh, when we cut it down. That was actually one of the trees we had to cut down to release an even nicer oak. One of the things I think most of us have experience with is the idea of a, of a shelter wood. And if you look at a shelter wood, you see a pretty even distribution across trees on the landscape. And I don't know, some of you might have noticed that after you do the final harvest on a shelter wood, when you cut down all these trees, and you take a look at the growth rings, you might have noticed that a lot of the trees have shown some pretty good uh, increased growth afterwards. Well, how I'm going to talk about uh, the shelter wood and how this relates to uh, crop tree management. In fact, the entire study, I'm just going to be talking about some of the studies we did here in New York. And one of the things, if you did uh, have a chance earlier or later to download uh, the uh, PDF of the uh, presentation, is I'll have some of the journal references on there if you want to get a hold of them. And this is a study we did, uh, started actually back in the 1980s. And one of the things we had on there is we had on a shelter wood, and we also had uh, crop tree management on there. And these are about five acre plots. This just happens to be an aerial view of one. And like I said, we had uh, two of the cutting methods I wanted to talk about today. And related to crop tree management. So we have the shelter wood, which is similar to a crop tree, although it has a very different objective. We're trying to get regeneration with the shelter wood. And then we had crop tree management, a uh, little bit different cutting styles. But here's what's interesting. If you look on, on this graph here, <clears throat> we actually looked at uh, volume growth over time on these stands over 18 year period. These were mature, approximately 80 year old, uh, primarily upland oak stands. And if you look in the bottom, you can see, you know, we had uncut, unmanaged stands. We had a shelter wood. And we had a stand where we did crop tree management. And if you look over on the uh, the vertical axis, we actually looked at how much board foot growth were we getting per year in these different cutting methods. And what's interesting is that on the uncut, we are getting uh, about 230 board feet per acre per year, a little bit less on the shelter wood and a little bit less in the crop tree. But they were actually uh, just about the same amount of uh, wood we were growing per acre per year, which is, is pretty interesting, especially if you look in the crop tree management, we were actually growing almost identical amount of oak uh, per acre per year. So one of the questions you might ask yourself is, how is it possible that we can get this high per acre volume growth with just a few trees? And that's one of the neat things about crop tree management that we're going to be talking about in our time together here. There's a couple of, of concepts where this will get across. And this idea was actually first uh, told and explained to me by Gary Miller of the U.S. Forest Service. So I want to give him full credit for that. The graph's a little bit complicated, but I think I can explain it to you in a way you can understand. The bottom of the graph has number of trees per acre. And the, the vertical graph has percent of stand value. But let's imagine we're thinking about things in our life that have value. And we're going to go from our most thing which has the most economic value to the thing it has the least. 
Well, you know, you probably start out with your house. That's $100,000. If you're lucky, you know, you might have $50,000 in your retirement savings account. Then your pickup truck might be worth, you know, $20,000. And you go down to, you know, it could be like a buddy of mine's got a $600 fishing pole. All the way down to, you know, your old boots, which are probably only worth 10 bucks anymore. But as you go through your things, they become less and less value. So the cumulative amount of, of net worth that you have becomes less and less. It's the same way with trees in the forest. There's a few trees out there which are worth a lot of money. But by the time you get to, you know, roughly 50 trees per acre, you count for about 90% of the value of the, uh, of the trees that are out there. And what's really interesting is it's actually between 10 and 20 percent, 10 or 20 trees per acre out there actually account for half of the value of the forest. And that's going to be one of the, the keystone or the key concepts in crop tree management. The idea that there's very few trees out there account for most of the value. So rather than try to manage the entire forest, the idea what we're thinking about is trying just to manage the, uh, the trees which are really worth some money. So how do you implement crop tree management? Well, crop, crop tree management, the concept is pretty similar to uh, growing radishes in the garden. You know, at least when I grow my radishes, I probably put in about 10 times more seed than I need. And you go through once they all come up, and then you pluck them until you get the nice spacing. It's the same thing in the forest. There's a lot more trees out there in a younger forest than you're eventually going to harvest and make money on. So it's, it's similar to uh, doing that weeding in the gardening or thinning in a radish row. You're trying to clear around those trees which have value, and you want to uh, put all the growth on them to concentrate the growth on them. One of the things you don't want to do, if you look at the picture in the lower left, that's a big old cabbage white pine. When you're doing this, you want to focus on trees which have a high potential value. And it could be in this case, maybe you did want a cabbage pine if you're trying to do Do it for a wildlife value, but most of the time you're going to try to pick a tree which has good quality. It's going to tend to last longer. Uh, it's going to be more resistant to storms. And it's going to give you either higher economic value, or if you're trying to produce soft mass for for, uh, for wildlife, it's going to produce more mass. So crop tree management, the uh, the idea behind it is that most of the economic and often the ecosystem uh, service values are concentrated on very few trees. So crop tree management, the idea is there is that you focus your limited management dollar on these high value trees. And this is especially important when a premium is paid for a grade or a species. You know, I'm more familiar with oak stand, so that's A pretty good uh, stem defect in it, or between a nice red oak, which is uh, you know two logs high, that's about 32 feet. Which one are you going to pick when you have to do it? You want to focus your growth on that high value tree. And one of the things I'm going to end up in the talk today uh, showing is that if you implement uh, crop tree management early in the stand and do it periodically, you can dramatically rotate or you can dramatically shorten your stand rotation. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk, uh, just give some examples from my work here. And if you guys have some comments, go ahead and put them in the chat if you have any questions. Uh, I'm going to talk about, first of all, doing pre-commercial crop tree release. Uh, something which, you know, pretty much anybody can do. If you've got a chainsaw or if you've got a machete, a woodsman's pal, you can actually just go out there and do it recreationally also. And we're going to talk in pole and saw timber uh, stands. Then in mature saw timber where we have some really nice stuff. And I'm going to tie it all together. And I do want to mention I'm going to have a, uh, a brief look at our new favorite species, which is uh, black birch, at least in this part of the world. So our studies are scattered all over the uh, great state of Connecticut, uh, pretty much in the central region. And I do want to thank everybody who's uh, given us land. And actually, a lot of times they've given us help with these studies, uh, Connecticut Division of Forestry. Metropolitan District Commission, that's a water company, the Torrington Water Company, Northeast Utilities, uh, Fruchi and Waliki has helped us out, Dr. Charles Larkin, he's passed on, but he allowed us to do research. And we also have some research plots on uh, 
South Central Connecticut Regional Water Authority lands. Now, I noticed that there were some people out there who weren't foresters, so I'm going to explain the concept of uh, crown class to you. Why crown class is important is crown class measures the relative uh, amount of sunlight the trees are, are, are being able to gather. The more sun that a tree has, the more sugars it's able to produce, the more the tree is able to grow. So if a tree is a dominant tree, it has a top and all of its sides are exposed to full sun. So that tree is, is really soaking up all the energy on the site. Uh, people are able to, uh, I'm sorry, I was reading a note over there at the site. So they're able to, uh, that energy they can also use to uh, grow more nutrients. And they're going to tend to grow faster. The other ones are co-dominants. Those are the trees, at the top of the tree, and, the, uh, and some of the sides of the tree are getting sunlight. The dominants and co-dominants are the trees you see when you stand on a hillside and look over that sea of trees down below. Now, intermediate trees are those which only the, the very top of the tree is getting sun. They're usually a little bit shorter than the, the co-dominants, but they aren't getting any direct sun on the sides. And then suppressed trees are those that are growing in the shade of other trees. Now the, the first study we're going to talk about was a pre-commercial crop tree release study. We started this, the stand ages actually ranged in age from uh, 7 to, I think it was 22 years old. The average stand age was 12 years old. The average diameter, that's DBH, was about 2.1 inches, and the average height was only 22 feet high. So these are fairly small trees. This graph here is... Let me go through step by step and explain how to understand the graph because it, it's pretty cool information. The first thing on the bottom, it shows the crown classic canopy closure. That's when we started the study. So dominant means co-dominant. COD means, I'm sorry, DOM means dominant. COD means co-dominant. So those are the really important crown classes. Those are the crown classes where they're getting full sun. Non and crop. Non means no crop tree release. And crop tree means we completely release the trees. Up there, the crown class at age 30 is, so what happened 18 years later? One of the things, you know, we go into a lot of our stands, or especially our oak stands, and we see that we don't have a lot of, um, a lot of the oaks are surviving. We want to have more oak out there. We aren't getting enough. canopy for the next 18 years, even if we do nothing. But if we look at co-dominant trees, we see if we do nothing when this stands like 12 years old, over the next 18 years, less than 40% of those trees are going to remain in the upper canopy. But if we look at where we do crop tree release, we see that by doing crop tree release, now we can have 80% of those trees are going to remain When we look at the uh, the other size classes, like the intermediate and the suppressed, these are the, the shorter trees, we see that crop tree management had a benefit, but whether or not it had much of a, more of a benefit, it's a little bit tough to tell. So let's just sort of assign. You can choose to save if you want you know a high quality oak or if you want we actually released a couple of shad bush because we wanted to uh, have those for birds out there you get to choose which trees are going to remain most co-dominant oaks including those with good form are going to die without release you know if you've got a limited number of oaks out there you've only got one opportunity uh, or you have a great opportunity to be able to make sure those are going to save there but just that single release doubled the odds that a co-dominant is going to thrive so whether or not it's worthwhile doing crop tree release on the dominants, probably not. Most of those are still going to make it in the young stand. Uh, so you really don't need to spend your time. Whether or not you do it on intermediates, if you don't have very I can't get the pointer to work. Oh, there it is. 
realizing that only 40% of those trees that you release are actually going to survive. But if you do nothing, only 7% of those trees are going to be in the upper canopy 18 years later. So it does give you an opportunity to do something. Okay, this slide didn't translate well when we moved it over. One of the things with crop tree release is how many sides are you going to release? You know, when we do a traditional thinning out there, we're usually releasing uh, roughly one or two sides of every tree. Sort of what you see over in the left-hand side. The idea behind crop tree release is you release that tree on all four sides. You give that tree plenty of growing room, plenty of light. Allow it to expand out. So if we come to the, the next thing. We're going to look in the bottom, and we see the, the crown classes from dominant, the really big trees, down all the way to the suppressed trees. Those are completely growing in the shade. And we look at how much diameter growth we had over the 18-year period. Now, if we look at, at dominance, let me grab the arrow again. If we look at dominance up here, if we release up to two sides, we really don't see any growth increase. But if we release it on four sides, we see that we gain, you know, roughly half an inch of additional diameter growth. It's a little, but it's not a lot. But in contrast, if we look down here at the co-dominant trees, once we release those on three or four sides, we see that we gain almost eight-tenths of an inch uh, increased growth just with this one single cut. So as we talked about before, we've really increased the chances that they're going to survive. And we've dramatically increased uh, their diameter growth. If you look down further on the intermediate trees, you know, those with only the tops getting out, there's some benefit, there's some increased diameter growth, but the, the benefit is is that Rather than only 7% of them remaining in the upper canopy, we're going to have about 40% of them remaining in the upper canopy. So we were kind of intrigued by this. Um, we would looked at, you know, sapling size stands, and we wanted to look at older stands. And I remember back when I was taking forestry classes in the 70s, you know, they said pretty much if a stand hadn't been managed by age 60, you know, you shouldn't go into it. So we wanted to look at some older stands. Uh, some 74 to 94-year-old uh, stands we went into. Generally speaking, these were on average sites. And at five different places, uh, we released 30 trees, and we didn't release 30 trees, and then we followed their diameter growth and their survival. Here's this really cool. If you look on, uh, on the bottom, we can see the number of sides that we released. We talked about before, you know, less than two. Or two. These are pretty typical of what you see in a standard, uh, just a regular thinning. And then we looked at what happened in crop tree management, where primarily we were trying to release uh, four sides. If you look at the diameter growth over nine years, if you don't do anything, we got about one and a half inches in diameter growth. If you released it, you got 2.3 inches. So almost an inch in increased growth over nine years with one cut. That's amazing. Think how much you can shorten rotations. If you take that one inch off, if you look over here, if you don't do any release, you're gaining uh, basically almost, uh, you know, seven, eight years worth of, of growth just by doing that. What's amazing is this worked for all diameter classes we looked at. Uh, the smaller trees responded even more, those that were less than 10 inches. Even trees which are greater than 16 inches, we still saw an increase in diameter growth. And part of the bottom line on that is if you look at board foot growth, for every diameter, the trees that were released had more diameter growth than the trees weren't released. So we are adding value onto the trees. We are actually increasing their board foot volume. So sort of tying this all together, let's just imagine, you know, a pretty standard number for crop tree release is 50 trees per acre. If you don't have 50 quality trees per acre, do less. But the idea is, is to try to shoot to have about 50 crop trees per acre when the stand's fully mature because that accounts for 90% of that stand value. So let's imagine if we go into that you know, 70, 80, early 90-year-old stand. Half the trees are 14 to 15 inches, and half your crop trees are greater than or equal 16 inches. And using the numbers from this study, we can then, then find that you're going to end up drawing about 1,000 uh, board feet per acre. MBF, MBF stands for 1,000 board feet per acre per decade of increased growth, 
what you focused on your high higher value trees. Rather than focusing all the growth on, you know, some poor form red maple or some scarlet oaks or whatever you have out there, what you're doing is you're refocusing that growth on high quality crop trees. So just a quick summary of what we found out of that is that the upper age limit at which oaks respond to crop tree release is at least 90 years old. And crop tree release can increase your diameter growth by 26 to 52 percent. And the crop tree release also increases volume growth, both cubic foot and board foot. And at this point, I just want to say, I'm looking over in the chat, if somebody has a question, feel free to type in uh, the question over there. Because I'm used to actually trying to get feedback from the audience. And so any questions you have, we'll try to answer as, as quickly as we can. Now, one of the things that foresters here in Connecticut have always been asking me about, they're there, well, that's great. We know that you can increase the growth of individual trees. But what about the actual stand? I mean, on a per acre basis, you know, not just theoretical, but what actually happens when you implement crop tree management out there in the landscape? So we decided to put in one, and we decided to really push up the age and the size limit. Uh, we thought we were getting older stands. We found out we are in a little bit higher site quality than we anticipated, even though site quality was still only in the, uh, I think it averaged about 67 feet. Uh, so that's, for Connecticut, that's fairly good. Um, we did this. The stands were 80 to 112 years old, and they were scattered around the state. Our crop trees, when we started, were about 21 inches in diameter, average height of about 85 feet. Uh, other oak saw timber was about 17 inches, and non-oak saw timber uh, was roughly uh, 14 inches in diameter. What's interesting, our crop trees, we started out with a pretty good grade. A butt log grade of 1.1 is, you know, is pretty good. The uh, other ones that we didn't cut, butt log grade is about 1.7. The lower the, the grade number, the higher the grade. So like grade one is good, grade three is bad. And how we did this is we set up areas. We set up 50 by 50 meter plots. Uh, we used 50 by 50 meters because that's how long our measuring tape was. And these were surrounded by two and a half acres where we, it says two and a half acre buffer. And what the buffer means, it just got the exact same treatment. So we had an area where we were actually uh, measuring, you know, how much uh, growth we are getting on a, we are able to convert it to a per acre uh, value. And there's a lot of different harvesting methods we use on these. These were all commercial harvest. Uh, two of the plots were harvested with a harvester and moved out with a border. Plots were uh, all chainsaw cut. Two of them were hauled out with a grapple skidder. Two of them were hauled out with a cable skidder. Uh, we hope to take a look at the data soon to see if there was a, a difference in uh, logging damage. Uh, we really didn't see one, and that was one of our concerns. If you get into these big stands and you start knocking down, you know, harvesting large trees but leaving other large trees, you're going to cause a lot of damage to the trees you leave out there. Just if you look in the lower right-hand corner where uh, Scott is cutting off that cookie, that happens to be the cookie that's in the front picture. That was one of the harvested trees. Now, now stocking is, as, as many of you know, is a measure of sort of how much of the site's being occupied. And once you get over 100% stocking, you, you have too many trees. And between 100% and 60%, actually can be a little bit lower stocking, you grow the same amount of wood per acre. It's just you refocus where the wood's growing at. So what we're just showing here is we level stand, which is more traditional forestry, where we just did a general thinning, and crop tree management. And what's interesting, our target goal here was only 20 trees per acre because they were larger trees. But when we did crop tree management and released 20 trees per acre, we ended up with the same amount of stocking as if we did a, a normal, typical, uh, general thinning out there in the forest. And one of the things, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, both the loggers and some of these plots are near where a lot of people can go walking by.
made the same comment. It was a pretty aesthetically pleasing plan. You really stand. You really had this mosaic where parts where you had, you know, several trop, crop trees were close together. It almost looked like a seed tree. Other parts where there just weren't any trees of economic value. We didn't do any harvesting, so it looked like an unharvested patch. So you really end up with this mosaic stand, which, you know, would be great from a wildlife standpoint. Uh, you know, we're growing, as I'll show you, you know, we're growing the same amount of timber, but it just has a, a really nice look to it. It doesn't look like a, a typical stand, managed stand. So the first thing we're going to sort of talk about here is um, individual tree response. How did the uh, individual trees, these larger, older trees, respond when we started doing management? And as you might expect, when we just do a general thinning, you know, a B-level thinning like we always uh, were taught back in forestry school, we saw an increase in diameter growth. And it's amazing we saw this increase in diameter growth. Remember, these stands had never been managed. A couple of them have been hit by gypsy moth, but not all of them. Uh, we saw an increase uh, in diameter, even in trees above 26 inches in diameter. We saw an increase in diameter growth. And it's pretty consistent. Uh, over five years, uh, roughly, they gained about four-tenths of an inch in diameter growth all the way across the board. So even the biggest trees we had out there, which we never, we thought there would actually be a limit at which you could release trees, even our biggest trees responded to uh, everyone. Yeah, they did have uh, a maple component. I think one of them had a beech component, but they are primarily oak-dominated stands. That's what we were trying to, to look at. Okay, there's another great question. Uh, Mike asks, how did you assess tree quality in these various studies? I'm really lucky. My technician worked for the U.S. Forest Service and the FIA uh, for two years, and we use the uh, forest uh, inventory and analysis standards for looking at tree quality. And the question is, with crop tree management, we say that the trees were healthier than if left to nature. Uh, what's you know what, this is a great point. I wish I'd put a slide in here. One of the foresters here pointed out something he saw in Shelterwoods, and we noticed in crop tree management, is that when you get into a stand, not so much in the, the sapling stands, you know, the younger stands, but when you get into older stands, you don't see the crowns getting wider and wider so much as you see the crowns getting fuller and fuller. You know, when you stand underneath uh, an unmanaged stand, especially an oak stand, it's almost like an umbrella where there's a, a layer of leaves up on top, but the center of the bowl doesn't have uh, very many leaves on it. But if when you're picking crop trees, if you pick healthy trees, and that's a, a real key criteria too, is you want to pick trees, the smoother the bark, the faster growing the tree. And they really, with practice, we almost never pick a tree now, which has a lot of epicormics come out after releasing <clears throat> on the bowl of the tree. But what you see is you see the crown of the tree within two years. The crown of the tree gets so solid that you can't see it when you look up underneath through it. So the tree basically, I, I think it close to doubles its leaf area by having new epicormic branches on the upper uh, big branches up above. So it produces a lot more leaves, and it fills out the crown, so it becomes more of a ball and less like an umbrella. And that's where I think we see the increased diameter growth. Other part we can't see is how the root systems are expanding into where the root systems of the cut trees used to be. Those are great questions. And here's what happens when we do crop tree management. Uh, we see that we get an even more of an increase in diameter growth. If you look at those trees, which are, um, you know, we'll say 23 to 26 uh, inches in diameter, we got more than half an inch uh, growth increase over a five-year period. That's an extra inch every decade. Pretty impressive. And again, we're going to be looking at this one here. We look at the number of sides released. If you do less than two sides, there is no difference between not releasing a tree and releasing it less than two sides. Those trees grew on average uh, about nine-tenths of an inch in diameter. But when we do four-sided crop tree release, over here, five, over a five-year period, 
we gained uh, four tenths of an inch diameter over uh, all the different diameter classes. So we're really adding uh, volume on every tree. You know, if you add half an inch onto a 20 inch uh, tree, you know, you're starting to ask uh, some real uh, volume. Question is, what was the residual basal area in the stand in the picture? Uh, you know what? Hold that question and ask me at the end because I'm going to, actually it's the one I didn't print up. I'm thinking the basal area, you know, I don't recall, so I don't remember exactly what I was going to say. Another question was, were the bowls of the crop trees subject to uh, epicormic sprouting? Um, that was what I was trying to explain earlier, is if you pick trees which tend to have smooth bark as part of your crop trees, if you, uh, if you pick strong codominance, or even, well, we'll just stick with strong codominance, you really very rarely see any epicormic sprouting on them. Uh, it's when you pick weaker trees, especially those which have very narrow crowns, those are the ones which uh, have an awful lot of epicormic branching. So if you, if you pick a tree which has like an average diameter, and uh, one of these stands in particular, the one which is, uh, I don't think ever had a gypsy moth, had the tightest oak crowns I've ever seen in my life. They were only about, you know, 20 feet wide. And even on that one, because we were trying to pick trees with the smoothest bark, uh, we just did not see any epicormic branches coming out. So the individual uh, tree response we saw in here is that oaks up to at least 26 inches uh, in diameter to respond to growth. And that if we're trying to increase uh, individual tree diameter growth. Oh, somebody wanted me to define epicormic. Sorry about that. Uh, epic, what epicormic branches are is uh, they're water sprouts. Actually, yeah, Pete's got one here. There are new sprouts on the stem. If you've walked into a stand and it almost looks like a bottle brush where you see a lot of uh, stems coming out uh, on the bowl of the tree, those are epicormic branches or um, or water sprouts. And even in the large trees, we're seeing uh, an increase in growth for over five years. Now, like I said before, one of the things that foresters here have been asking me about is what's the stand level response? Now, I haven't had time to actually work up the board foot numbers on these, but if we look over a five-year period and we look at net basal area change, um, basal area is, a, especially in, in saw timber, it's going to be a pretty good correlation with how much board foot you're growing out there. And you can see that over the five-year period, we look at crop trees. Crop trees are growing just about uh, as much basal area as the uh, the unmanaged stands. So what we're doing, we have fewer uh, saw timber trees on the crop tree, and we're getting almost as much basal area growth, which means we're focusing focusing it on the um, the remaining crop trees that we have. So let's do the first tie together. That most uh, sapling and pole timber oaks are lost without management. And then we we'll come back to some of the epicormics over in the chat. Uh, crop tree management allows you to select the winners. So one of the things you want to make sure that you do is you don't invest in low quality stems. And that the uh, growth increase is proportional to the uh, amount of release. The more you release a tree, the more that you uh, are going to have that tree uh, have its growth increase. And it's interesting that oaks from 2 inches up to 26 inches uh, respond to release. And the best investment is made on codominant stems with great potential. I noticed there's a little bit of a, uh, a side conversation here about epicormic branching. And I think a lot of it is when you talk about aspect and topo and soil type affecting epicormic branching, all that really relates back to is how healthy the tree is. The healthier the tree from everything I've read and everything I've seen, the healthier the tree is, the less a chance it's going to have epicormic branchings. If you're on a south-facing aspect or if it's got thin soils, or if it's a sandy soil, all those things which can stress trees, stressed trees are the ones that produce epicormic branching. And stressed trees tend to be those which aren't doing so well. I would disagree that you can't simplify a little bit, but the more a tree is stressed, the more you're gonna see epicormic branching. I think there's a little bit more if we look at the overall crop tree 
thing. One of the things from, from our studies and looking at other studies is we look at crop tree management. If you were to come in every 12, 15 years and make sure that those trees are released, you can grow the trees at about a quarter of an inch in diameter per year. If you do thinning, in our neck of the woods, you're going to grow about uh, two-tenths of an inch in diameter per year. If you don't do release, you're only going to grow at about 0.15 inches per year, or about six inches. It'll take it about six inches to grow uh, an inch. So if you put in crop tree management, you can get a tree up to 12 inches in diameter in 52 years. If you do nothing, it's going to take you 79, 80 years. So you're cutting off almost 30 years of the rotation if, if you're just growing it to 12 inches. If you're growing to 16 inches up so we can start having some veneers, uh, some grade one logs out there, the crop tree management, you can do it in 68 years. If you don't do anything, it's going to take you 105 years. So you're cutting off almost 40 years off the rotation. You can dramatically shorten your rotation uh, just by putting in crop tree management. Thinning helps, but crop tree management can help even more. So what you need to remember is that most of the value in that forest is on very few trees per acre. And most of the economic and ecosystem services are concentrated on a few trees, as I said before. Oh, the question was, this assumes you do multiple releases. Yeah, the idea is, is come in probably about maybe uh, after you do the first release, come in about 10 years. After that, probably about 15 years. One of the things is you don't want to release the trees too hard uh, or too often, or else you can uh, start shortening the amount of bole that you're going to have, which doesn't have live branches on it. Uh, our observations, and actually we're working on this right now, is that uh, if you wait 15 years uh, after you do the release in the sapling stand, those trees uh, clear up to uh, about the second log now as, as clear of branches. And then you just want to come in there periodically, uh, you know, about 15-year intervals. Uh, the first two might be pre-commercial unless you've got a good biomass market. After that, uh, you know, you should be able to start coming in and having uh, some commercial harvest. Like I said, about every 15, 10 years after the first one, and then probably about 15 years. And that's a guess because I'll tell you the truth, none of us have had any uh, experience growing through that many road or that many cutting cycles yet. So one of the neat things is, is you can dramatically uh, shorten stand rotations. And I think crop tree management asks, offers a real opportunity to increase stand and regional productivity. Uh, I was going to mention a little bit about black birch, which in a lot of the northeast is becoming more and more prevalent, in part because of partial cutting. Black birch does absolutely great under partial cutting. Black birch is often a common species wherever we've had hemlock woolly adelgid. I suspect in northeastern parts of New York and probably in Pennsylvania where we lose ash, uh, you're commonly going to see black birch coming in. And you really see black birch coming in in areas where there's a pretty good deer herd too. And just like what we were looking at before, we looked at number of size release with black birch. We did this over a bunch of different stand ages. I wasn't going to go into detail on that. But overall, if you do less than uh, and two sides released, it's just like you didn't do a release. Over eight years, they grew about an inch. But if you release them on four sides, we got almost an additional inch diameter growth. So you can add some real uh, diameter growth to black birch. One of the questions you, whoops, this one first. So the question, so your, your choice is, if you can go into a 4-inch black birch stand, I tell you, it's the greatest stand in the world to cut for firewood. Because um, everything is, they just clean up nice. So you can start going into uh, a 20-year-old stand, they're about 4 inches in diameter, and start doing crop tree management. You can get them up to a 12-inch uh, veneer peeler log. Black birch has a really small diameter for peelers. You can do it in 33 more years. If you don't do anything, you're going to have to carry that stand for 65 years. But the question is, is it worthwhile to go in there because of nectary canker? Well, one of the neat things about nectary canker that we've seen by dissecting a lot of trees here, and I'm blanking out on the guy's name. Was it Finley who did it over in Pennsylvania? Once a part of a tree gets to 4 inches in diameter, whether it's at the butt of the tree or if it's 30 feet up, 
30 feet up in the air. Once that part of the tree uh, gets up to uh, 4 inches in diameter, it really doesn't get nectary canker. If you cut down and dissect a tree like you can see here in the left-hand side, where you, you dissect a tree where there's nectary canker, you see the canker almost always starts when the tree is less than 4 inches in diameter, which means that you can go into those young stands and start roguing out or cutting down all those trees which have nectary canker. Uh, one of the questions is, is what's the recommended distance between release for trees? It's not so much the recommended distance as the number of trees. If you do 50 trees per acre, that's going to put trees at about a 30 foot spacing. A lot of times you're not going to have 50 trees per acre out there that are crop tree. So what your goal is, is when you're going through is to pick, uh, pick your trees and try to have uh, the quality trees where you can release all the way around them, then find the next quality trees. If you have two quality trees that are side by side, you can actually pick those two trees as a unit and, and thin all the way around those trees. So if, it's kind of hard to draw right here and wave my hands, but if we imagine that this is a tree and that this is a tree and everything else is a forest, if you were to cut everything around these two trees, and treat those as, as one crop tree, that's just as effective. Like I said, three or four uh, sides. The other question is, if you release a crown touching release, we just do crown touching release. We don't do a set distance. Remember, the reason why we do crown touching is, is we're trying to increase the amount of sunlight which is hitting that tree. And if you go a set distance out, if you start looking up in trees, especially oaks, uh, the crowns can be completely lopsided from where the center of the tree is. So another question, do you recommend long-term marking of crop trees for tracking? That's just going to add to your expense. I think after you do the first crop tree release, it's pretty obvious which trees you thinned around. The other thing, you're going to have some trees which were near crop trees which you didn't pick, uh, which occasionally some of those guys are going to do really well. Uh, occasionally, like we had one crop tree got hit by lightning and just completely blown to pieces. So, there's another good, the main factor in growth is soil. If you don't have good soil, you can't have a good garden with high productivity. Well, the one thing we have to do as foresters is we have to work with the soil that we have out there. And what you can do is try to grow the trees that are appropriate to the site. If you've got a, a really low, a site with really low base without a lot of calcium, magnesium, Probably not a good idea even if you have some sugar maples out there to keep trying to grow them. Um, you might want to switch to a species uh, like oak or actually uh, at least black birch will do better in a uh, low base site. I find that the foresters is having to remark crop trees as they work their way through the woods. That's one thing we've talked around here. We've like I said, our biggest plot we've done is five acres, and we didn't. We just went through and, and marked as we went. And I don't know if you were, to, like I said, if you were to come back 15 years later, uh, you can always make another uh, judgment when you go through. Just to quickly summarize, black birch. Black birch is uh, increasing in many forests in in, in the north, especially in the northeast in part because of changes in disturbance regimes. That means a lot more partial cutting and too many deer. And black birch respond well to release. And it looks like stems that are less than four inches are resistant to neonectria. That's a new name for, for nectaria canker. So with that, it looks like we have some time for some All right. Questions. Thank you, Anybody Jeff. Let me, uh, while there, folks are thinking of their questions, I'm going to reconfigure the screen a little bit. Um, I want to make sure that we get our exit survey set up, and I'll put the, oh, what's the other one I want to put up? The continuing education link. Put that back in, so in case somebody came in late and they need to, hang on, don't type in that one. There. to call your attention to the screen in the 
In the top right is the exit survey. It's essential that everybody complete this survey. It helps us document the quality of the presentations. Jeff gave a great presentation, and I, I thank him for that. I learned a lot. It was. It was survey data helps me um, provide information to speakers. I know Jeff has to fill out forms annually to document the, the effort that he's putting out, and we've just gone. does a good job of showing to my administrators why they're making the investments they're making of your tax dollars in this kind of technology. So please, please click on that link and you can fill it out as soon as we wrap up. And then we see, um, and then I'll turn it back over to Jeff. The, the questions are popping in. I see there are at least three people typing in as we speak. Um, and I think the last question we had, or word Jeff will pick up, is uh, Mike Sanders had a 1244 comment um, that was related back to Jim Wilkins. So. I gotta tell you that that's that's a great question. The the question while well, everybody can read the question, uh, the question is is whether or not in older stands uh, in uh, degrade veneer quality. I tell you. I don't know what part of the world oh, in Indiana. One of the things that we don't have the problem with, we don't have a lot of veneer here, so we're just trying to grow grade one logs. With the veneer, it's really going to depend upon your buyer. Um, if I know a lot of the German buyers like to have very even uh, ring growth width. In which case, if the stand had uh, been thin before and you've got really small rings and then you open it up, it's going to have an impact on a veneer. If you could start crop tree management, from when they were young and keep your ring with us even throughout by doing it that way, I think it would work. But I think that's a great point. You're going to have to look at the local market. And if the, the buyers want, want to have very even ring widths, uh, if you open the stand up really fast, do crop tree management, you're going to increase that ring growth with or the ring sizes, so then it's going to have a degradation. The next question was, do you think crop tree release is effective in uneven age stands, even age? What's interesting is that very first one I mentioned where I talked about multi-age crop tree management, then actually we're trying to We've gone through two cutting cycles in establishing a five-age crop tree management system, which is one of the neatest looking systems I've ever seen. So yeah, I think it can definitely be done. Um, but that, if you refer to, I'm trying to remember which paper it was. It was a Northern Journal paper. If you've downloaded the handout, you can see what it is. If you can't get a hold of it, ask me and I'll get you a copy on it. Question, next question was, why do deer not browse black birch? Uh, that's because black birch have methyl solicitate. When you scratch black birch or yellow birch, it's that really nice birch deer smell. Uh, that's methyl solicitate. That's the active ingredient in Bengay. And they can only eat uh, so many uh, pounds of it a day before they actually become poisoned. 
Next real question. Beaver door black birch. Uh, does the size of the tree release affect growth potential? Not that I know of. We haven't looked into that. And so Jeff, your uh, voice is cutting in and out for me. I don't know if it's the same for others. Okay, sorry about that. It says, will you please send the PDF of the file of the presentation? If you could explain or put up again, Pete, where they could actually download the. P oh, you already did that. Okay. Black Birch was marked hard by a forester when doing a CSI. Does it get, it's going to depend upon what your local market is for Black Birch. I'm not going to say the price is great around here. Um, Oak, the last market survey I saw was around 180, 190, a, a thousand. Uh, Black Birch, I think, was around 80, but that was still better than a lot of the other species that were doing 40. But one of the things, when Pete and I were talking yesterday, I know uh, some of you may have used Dave Smith's uh, Practice of Silviculture book. And he was telling me when he got to Connecticut back in the 40s, he couldn't give away oak. They were cutting it as a weed species because uh, people just wanted to grow maple. He was saying there's something similar uh, that he heard about when he was uh, just starting yes, out. Yes, I'm here. I, Jeff, I'm, uh, your voice is you breaking up for me. I don't know if other folks are. Yeah, you were telling me there's a similar thing. The thing is. So can you. I can hear you. Yep. I don't know why my voice is breaking up. I'm not moving. Is it still there? Yeah, well, the, the thing is that market, you're going to have to. What species you grow in, in part for market. But the other thing is realize that markets change over time. If Martha Stewart goes on Oprah and says we want Oprah. Oak furniture is the cat's pajamas. That's all anybody's going to be growing. So, I mean, I personally think you should grow the highest quality trees you can grow on the site. Um, and markets will shift around. And the fact is, what are you going to do? Restart uh, growing whichever trees you have out there? Because um, it's going to take you another 40, 50 years, and by then the markets are going to change. So, just grow the highest quality trees you, you have on the site, and then when it comes time to regenerate, I, you know, I really think unless you're growing, you know, uh, for biomass, what you want to do is you just want to grow what grows best on the site. say if anybody ever comes to Connecticut and wants to go out and take a tour of our plots uh, more than happy any excuse just to be going out and talking to another forester out in the woods is a good idea and some of these spots are absolutely beautiful Two people are typing, but does anybody else have any uh, questions they want to ask? Or well, well, let me, uh, Jeff, let me says, jump while the folks are typing in some questions and um, offering comments. Just remind you to, to click on that link in the exit survey that's in the top right corner that will uh, open a web page for you to take the survey. The survey is on average. Uh, only take two or three minutes to complete, but it, it's a it's a simple way for us to gather some essential information that we can use to justify and support the use of this technology. So, all right, Jeff, I see that um, Herb has a question about. Yeah, one of the questions is, yeah, what's the best time of the year? Yeah, what's the best time of the year to do crop tree release? Um. We've done it year round. I don't think it makes a difference. The big thing is is just do it when the soil conditions are okay for driving your equipment around like any other forest harvest operation. Um, you know, there it's a during August, you know, there's a there can be a problem with staining. You know, some of those hot high humidity days, but I think it's more well, that's interesting. Do, 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 do. I think it's just like any other harvesting, you can go out there and mark it whenever, but then you're going to be limited by uh, soil conditions on harvesting and a little bit of in the summer for staining. 
It's interesting. Curious to see about Mike Sanders. If you could do me a favor and send me a, a preview of that, just to read, is that okay? Uh, the question is: Is there anything about crop tree management and riparian forest buffers? Uh, if you actually look at the uh, first crop tree one that came out by, oh, you know, I might have to step away. You might lose me a second. It was done by Arlen Perky. Uh, that's has a great section in there on riparian uh, using crop tree in riparian areas, especially to absorb uh, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, coming off of farm fields is one of the things on there. I don't know the new crop tree book that was done by uh, Gary Miller, uh, Jeff Stringer, and shoot, I'm forgetting the other guy's name. Yeah, shoot me. Uh, I don't know if that one mentions riparian. Actually, that's a good comment down there about the game of logging. I sent my technician to it, and uh, what a difference in the quality and the safety of his work. Any of you who are foresters, it's always kind of fun to, to spend a whole week with loggers, too. One of the things that's nice about crop tree management is when you're talking with uh, landowners, unless you're growing veneer, is it's uh, a concept which is a lot, it's easy to explain to them. And especially if you're an extension forester and working with a small landowner where they might have 10, 20 acres, uh, it's something that they can implement themselves cutting firewood because they can see that they you show them how to pick a crop tree and they can actually go around and, and do the release themselves and cut around the tree. Have you ever done crop tree release using herbicide to kill trees using seeds? We actually, with a, the pre-commercial, we did uh, use hack and squirt. Some lawyers now have said here in Connecticut um, that it's not a good idea to produce any snags anymore because you're willfully creating a hazard, and if somebody gets hit by one, you're legally responsible for the life of that snag. So no one is doing uh, any, it used to be mostly chainsaw girdling around here. Nobody's creating snags anymore because of the legal liabilities. So God bless the lawyers. Done if crop tree release has in fact caused. The question is, what should crop tree release be done if you've caused epicormic branching? Carrying these trees forward. Well, if you're in a saw log stand, You've got about 10 years, and I would just harvest those trees because uh, I'll tell you what, you're going to get screwed when you sell it. But those epicormics, in fact, are just going to be in the slab wood in the first 10 years. After that, it's going to start getting in. But you're still going to get slammed. If anyone's hearing that timber, apparently my email is also going through. I'm here. here. I just only get some of your you hear some of your sound, Jeff. But everybody else is hearing fine, so keep going. Okay, I just didn't know if they were hearing the timber. The thing is, once a tree has an epicormic branch, um, you know, for the first ten years. Those epicormics are just going to show up in the slab wood, but you're still going to get slammed when you try to sell it because it's still going to. So you might as well get it out of there, you know, the next opportunity do you have to go in. I tell you, with a little bit of practice, and if you go back, and that's something I can't emphasize enough, is go back to the stands you manage five, ten years later and take a look at the trees. You get so much more feedback. That's the one benefit. Of, uh, of being a researcher is we get to go back to our stands all the time. But if you're practicing forestry, try to make a, a point of spending a couple of days a year just going back and looking at the stands. Like I said, five, ten years later. And you'll start to get a real feel for you know which trees, especially crop tree management, what to pick for. Snags are a real issue between OSHA, the lawyers, and the wild lifers. One side wants none, and one side wants a whole lot. All right, Jeff, can you hear me? 
Okay, good. <laughs> I didn't know if you were talking to me or not. Well, it looks like we've uh, yeah we've uh, started to uh, questions have slowed down a lot. There's a couple more coming in here on maybe on snags or observations about snags. But I want to take this uh, chance to thank Jeff very much. This was a great presentation, and thank the audience. You all had some great questions, and and it helped uh, all of the questions. I think help you all. Um, learn more both collectively and individually and it helps give Jeff feedback as well to uh, to understand the kind of the pulse that's happening amongst the audience so uh, to my thank to you all my thanks to you all and my thanks to Jeff as well a final plug for the exit survey in the upper right hand corner please take a moment to complete that and uh, for those of you that are interested uh, Jeff will be back again at seven o'clock tonight to give the same pressure presentation again live. It's been recorded and the recording will be available online. Um, I usually am able to post it first. If you go to, let me type it in, info Pete's typing that. I wanted to say thank you guys for some great questions in there. It's feedback from uh, and the people on the field that really keep us honest and keep us thinking about how to... So the, the forum link that I put there from forceconnect.info, uh, that's a, a forum, interactive forum, question and answer, discussion kind of forum. Um, there's also, so that's where I'll first post the links to the recordings. That's also if there are some additional questions that come in through the exit survey, uh, Jeff will uh, hopefully be able to answer some of those and we'll post a response to those 